All right, guys, welcome back as, yes, we get to start a whole new segment. I mean, think about this. We have covered uh, the Pentateuch. We have five books there. We've covered the Gospels, four books there. And if you're just joining us, we are now jumping into, yes, it's known as Lesson 1 in the book of Joshua, the historical books. But this is also, Kevin, how many, how many lessons have we done? 200! 200! <laughs> Think about this, okay? It, it covers from Joshua all the way to Nehemiah, okay? MacArthur kind of categorizes it's a, a period of a thousand years, okay? Roughly 1405 BC to 424 BC. So we're going to cover a period of almost a thousand years in Kevin, how many months? Five. Yeah, five. So a thousand years and five months. This is going to be a good time. They're coming in possession of a promised land after a 430 year period of slavery in Egypt and a 40-year period of wandering around in the wilderness, okay? That's where we're coming from, just as a, as a refresher. What I want to do just real quick is, is I want to paint a bigger picture before we get to, to Joshua. I want to talk more historical books if I can. One of the things I've really enjoyed is, is that you have the pre-exile, the exile, and then the post-exile. So before they're whisked away, right, into captivity, Joshua judges Ruth, First and Second Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles are all written before the exile time, okay? Then during exile, you're going to have Esther. But then post-exile, you have Ezra and Nehemiah. So just a big picture. We're going to be talking about they're not taken into captivity. And you're like, wait, they have to go back into captivity? Yes. Didn't they just come from captivity? <laughs> yes. And then you'll begin to wonder why all of these components. Now, another way of looking at the historical books, okay, is pre-kingship. Okay, so prior to Israel having a king, which we know who their first king was, who? Saul. King Saul. So prior to King Saul, you have Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. During the kingship, you have 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd <laughs> Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Post-kingship, okay, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So just some thoughts through of, you know, they, they, they coincide with exile and post-exile, kingship, and post-kingship. So... Just, just something to think through. Twelve books, a period of how, how time frame, Kevin? How many years? Was it about a thousand? A thousand years. Okay, I'm going I'm to go back to you, Kevin, on this one on a regular basis. So you have Joshua all the way to Nehemiah. Now let's talk a little bit about Joshua, okay? Think about this. Joshua, okay, he is the understudy of who? Sean, let's go to Sean. Moses. Okay, good. Sean, you got that one already. Okay. Uh, Numbers 27, 18 through 23. You don't have to go there, Kevin, but just talking about he's going to be taking the baton, from um, uh, from Moses. Anybody know what Joshua means? Any thoughts on this? Couple. Yeshua. Yeshua, kind of. That's yes, kind of. That means Jesus. So yes, in that context, because the New Testament version of Joshua is Jesus. So you would be right. The meaning is Jehovah saves, or the Lord is salvation. Say that again. Joshua in the New Testament version, Sean is right, it's Jesus. And the meaning of both of those is the Lord is salvation or Jehovah saves, right? So it's kind of a cool, uh, a cool phrase. So you can already think and understand how Joshua is going to be a foreshadow, right, of, of Jesus. What Joshua does, if his name means something, you're going to see a lot of this. Now, our one word, this is going to be interesting. Do you guys happen to know what our one word for Joshua is? Commander. Commander. We're going to get into this with Mindy's painting. I love this painting, okay? We're going to get into the, the arm, the random arm that you see here, but we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in the context of the next couple lessons coming up about how the commander of the Lord's army, okay, we'll talk about who that commander is, but Jesus, okay, we're going to talk about is the commander that introduces and interacts with Joshua. So here you have, can I just say this? Two, two guys with the same names interacting with each other. So Joshua means, I'm going to say this again, Jehovah saves. It also means the Lord is salvation. And in the New Testament, Sean, what does it mean? Yeshua, Jesus. Yeshua and Jesus. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the author. Okay, the author we know of the book of Joshua is, any guess, Rich? Joshua. Joshua. Son of none. <laughs> some, some would say if they don't like that, which we would say it is Joshua. There's other thoughts out there. It could be the high priest Eleazar or his son Phineas. Anyway, Joshua, he's approaching 90 years old, okay, when he becomes the leader. I think that's an interesting. He ended up dying, okay, in uh, Joshua 24, 29, at the age of 100 
and 10 years old. So he's taking the, the reins at pretty much an, an older gentleman, and then he dies at the age of 110. The theme that you're going to see throughout the book of Joshua, okay, and I love this theme, is that we're seeing the fulfillment or the faithfulness, either way you want to look at it, of God's promise. God's promises are coming to fruition in the book of Joshua. Because what did we hear all throughout the Pentateuch? Over and over, Kevin, what did we hear? Uh, the promise of the land. The promise of the land. God is going to give the Israelites land. Funny enough, the ones that he was promising, none of them got to get in. Only two got to get in, Joshua and Caleb. So two guys are going to experience the faithfulness of God. And interesting enough, as we transition into Joshua, the book of Joshua, even on chapter 13, just want to make sure you understand, Israel does fail, though, to press in their conquest and to gain every part of the land. So not only does God have his faithfulness and say, I'm going to give the land, but Israel then, as we see throughout the middle of the book of Joshua, they don't do the part that God's asked them to do. So it's kind of weird. God's faithfulness is there, but isn't that true in all of our lives? God's faithfulness is always in our lives. The question is, will we be obedient to what he's asking us to do? And so this is kind of the, the bigger picture. Now, what I want to do, and again, I want to really set the stage because I really believe there's a transition. If you go to Joshua 1, verse 1, it just says this, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, who had served Moses. There's obviously this clear transition of, of, of leadership. And what Warren Wearsby said, he says, God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. Moses is dead, but does that imply that God's work is dead? No. And so I think part of any business, any organization, any ministry, you should always set it up where it's never dependent upon one person. In fact, J. Oswald Sanders, I'm going to pull my paper up here to read this, and it says this, A work originated by God and conducted on spiritual principles, okay, will surmount the shock, and I think this is important, of a change of leadership. Okay, in other words, it will survive through this and indeed will probably thr thrive better as a result when you are literally built on spiritual principles rather than a person. And so the challenge, even what we can learn here in Joshua, is that Moses, even though Moses is dead, the work's going to continue on. And in fact, you can prove it today. In 1948, Israel became a nation. There's so much that God's doing in this little tiny country that it's not dependent upon one person. It's God's purpose and God's... God's plan. So here's what I want to do. I want to go through this. John MacArthur talks through the life of Joshua. In other words, uh, how did he get Joshua ready? Okay, does that make sense? And, and number one is, I want to write this. First of all, remember this. He was born into Egyptian slavery, right? That, that's what they knew. And then he was trained under Moses. So I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you eight items, and we'll see how far we get through this. I'm going to teach through the verses. But number one is, that in this process of transition, the leadership, you know what Joshua had to do? Joshua had to experience service. Joshua had to go through, and in Exodus 17, verse 10, you'll see that Joshua's role was clearly to serve. Okay, Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against the Malachite while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So what was Joshua doing? He was serving Moses very, very clearly. And in fact, that same verse can be used for his second context as well. Not only was he uh, uh, in the role of a servant, and I, I, MacArthur wrote this word. It's kind of a weird word. He was soldiering. <laughs> John, you want to challenge that word? No, not MacArthur. Okay, soldiering. Because again, not only was he serving, but what was he doing? He was also fighting. I, I think sometimes younger generations, and I'll just say young millennials, okay? I think this is a fair statement. A lot of times, as we encounter young millennials, uh, they do get a bad rap. And sometimes the reason they get a bad rap is because the mentality is, is they always want to jump to like immediate leadership. Like immediate, I want to be in charge of anything. But not just young millennials. I think we all had that thought process even as we were growing up. Like, how can I get to the top of the, uh, of the food chain? How can I get to that CEO status without having to go through the battle? What I love about Joshua as he begins to transition into this leadership, he went through the journey. He went through this battle. So he was serving. He was serving as a soldier. And I love number three, what Joshua experiences. You know what he does? He's a scout. He goes through scouting. In Numbers 13 and 14, right? How many scouts did he send in? How many, how many scouts did Moses send? Twelve. Twelve. And only two came back with positive, positive reports. He was one of them. But I love this is that he went in, he had to assess the situation and then come back and report what he saw. And so Joshua, he is, in order to create 
a, a role as a leader. He's serving. He's serving in the military. He uh, obviously number three. Joshua serves as a scout. And number four, uh, supplication. Kevin, can you go to Numbers twenty-seven, verse fifteen? Numbers twenty-seven, verse fifteen. Supplication by Moses. So Moses appealed to the Lord, verse 16, it says this, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the community, verse 17, who will go out before them and come back, come back in before them, who will bring them out and bring them in, so that the Lord's community won't be like sheep without a shepherd. Moses went before the Lord, and what does he do? He asks the Lord, Lord, bring somebody that would understand this mentality. And it's Joshua. It's a cool picture. So uh, somebody else is praying for the new, the new leadership. Kind of the obvious one, but you're going to see this is, is, Kevin, if you would go to Numbers 27, verse 18, which you already are there. The Lord replied to, to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, Nun, a man who has the Spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. So when there's prayer from Moses, you should also see very clearly that it needs to be sovereignty of God. Like Joshua needs to be put into this place from the Lord. It's not man appointed. No, Moses prayed, but God said, Yes, this is... This is my man. And I think that's important as you understand the book of Joshua. God clearly appointed Joshua. Okay, number six. I think one, one of the things that's really need to see, be evident, and you can use this, you guys, these principles in leadership in any area as you transition into any company, any business, even in, in families. You should see the Spirit's presence in that person. It's one thing to say, oh yeah, God's appointed this person, but if the Spirit is not moving in that person, who wants that person in leadership? That's just called a stick in the mud. <laughs> we got a lot of stick in the muds, I'm telling you guys. When the Holy Spirit moves and flows, that's when you're like, yes, this is God's appointed person. Now, number seven, okay, if you would, uh, you're going to see separation by Moses. Again, in Numbers 27, 18, keep going to verse 19, Kevin, if you would. Uh, it just says this, and it says, and have him stand before Eleazar, the priest, the whole community, and commission him in their sight. So what you're going to see is, is that Moses then begins to experience the separation. Like Moses clearly says, okay, this is from God. I'm separating him. He is the leader. Does that make sense? There's actually an action plan. And then it says in verse 20, confer some of your authority on him so that the entire Israelite community will obey him. Verse 21, he will stand before Eleazar who will consult the Lord for him with the decision of the Urim. He and all the Israelites with him, even the entire community, will go out and come back at his command. And so God just, there's a clear distinction setting this man apart. I mean, think about the New Testament. You have Paul and Barnabas. They are being set apart. Joshua is clearly being set apart. And then the last one is number eight in the area of leadership. Uh, Kevin, if you go to Numbers 32, verse 12, you will see selflessness. Uh, none except Caleb, son of... Uh, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, and Joshua, son of Nun, because they did follow the Lord completely. And so, in other words, there was selflessness in following the Lord. Like, they were in. They were totally, radically sold out. And in an area of a leadership, you should expect to see selflessness. I don't know. I, I like this, this, these categories of how Joshua got to the point. And I think that's important to understand, because when you go to Joshua 1, verse 2, Kevin, let's go there if you can says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all of my people prepare, okay, to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. You guys, like, this is a big deal. Like, this is the land we've been waiting for. This is the land we've been talking about. I mean, this is the land, 200 lessons, right? Really, I mean, it's not because we covered the, uh, the New Testament as well, but this is what the people have been waiting for. God clearly promised this land. Like, this is the land, and just as a refresher, Genesis 12, verse 7, if you'd go there, okay? I know we talked about this, but you're going, to get, you're going to hear this a lot. Genesis 12, 7, what? Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your offspring. This land right here that was promised to Abraham, guess what? Is going to start seeing fulfillment come in Joshua 1, verse 2. Your people are going to cross into the land. This is the offspring. They are the offspring of Genesis 12. 12, verse 7. In fact, just one more, Kevin, go to Genesis 13, verse 14. This is the land that you'll see all throughout the, Pent the Pentateuch that was promised. Genesis 13, 14. Uh, this is kind of cool. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, look from the place where you are, look north, south, east, and west. It goes on to verse 15. For I will give you and your offspring forever 
all the land that you see. Like God is clearly promising this land. And now in verse two of Joshua one, he says, hey, by the way, this is the land you're going to walk into. Verse three of Joshua one, it says, I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. You know how cool that is? That's like walking into complete, like, uh, I've never been here, but everywhere your foot, everywhere, Sean, I'm going to challenge you here. Everywhere your foot steps, he says, that's my land. That's the land I have promised since Abraham. And you need to walk into this, into this confidence. Can you imagine every single time you walked? It's yours. Now, this could be a stretch, but I'm going to go there. Romans 10, verse 15. I don't know. As I was praying through this lesson, I just, I felt like, you know, thinking about the feet. And this image of Romans 10, 15, how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel good things. Can you imagine if those that share the gospel had this imagery of that everywhere they walk to share the gospel, God says, I've already prepared the way. Like, can you imagine every time you took a step, you walked in confidence, God says, I've already prepared the way. I've already paid the way for you to declare the gospel. And I, I feel like it's just this little, little picture, this little foreshadow of saying, God said, I'm here. I'm going to be with you as well. Just a cool picture to me of what is to come. And then he says in verse four, your territory, every time you take a step, this land that I promised Abraham, oh, by the way, here's what it looks like. Your territory will be from the wilderness and the Lebanon to the great Euphrates River. And so what you're going to see here up on the screen is, and then all of the land of the Hittites and west, okay, to the Mediterranean. Okay, so now this is a great picture right here. This is kind of a, a, a map that you'd see in biblical times. Now I want to show a modern day times video, uh, picture. Okay, this right here is the modern day uh, picture. Here you have obviously the Mediterranean Sea. You have Lebanon. You have Israel down here. You have Jordan on the other side of the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And then you have the Jordan River that's splitting it. Now watch the land that was promised based on Joshua 1, 4. This is the land that was promised. If you're geographically like, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. Why? Because according, according to the scripture verses, Syria, Lebanon, all the way down here into the Gaza, over on the other side of Jordan, into Damascus, you realize that this is the land that God promised Israel. Whew. Rich, why do you think people are going to have a hard time with this one? Because it doesn't look like the current map today that Israel occupies, that there's more land that they have been promised, that they do not occupy. So why is it so important, you guys? You have to understand something. Why is it so important that we don't divide the land? That this little chunk, okay, that we have right now for Israel, okay, that this little chunk, right, we're even trying, when I say we people, are trying to politically say, oh, let's give this land here and this land here. But God says, this is going to be your territory. So we're, we're basically saying, you know what, forget that promise that God said, let's just divide it. And there is some serious tension that comes when you start dividing the land. And I have to tell you, it's happening all the time. You want to know why? We think that when we bring peace to that land, it's when we give people land. <laughs> and it actually goes against everything of what God promised. Oh, but Kyle, aren't you for, for the Palestinians and loving them? Yes, absolutely. In fact, when we come into, into, into the Middle East, we love hanging out with Palestinians. We love hanging out with Arabs. In fact, we love on them just like we would love the Jewish people. But I'm just going off a of scripture and the scripture says, oh, by the way, that's the Jewish people's land. And, and I think to me, that's not a, a racial comment. That's not a, oh, I'm against this person or this person. I love both communities. I'm just going off of what it says in scripture. God is a big God and he wants to paint a picture of the boundary of truly of the land. So Kevin, if we can, let's go to Joshua 1, verse 5. As you think about this land, he says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. So Joshua, as long as you live, I will be with you just as I was with your, your predecessor, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or forsake you. Now, <coughs> I love this line. I love this line because over and over in Scripture, okay, he promises this to multiple people. Kevin, can you go to Genesis 28, verse 15? Genesis 28, verse 15. He says, look, I am with you. This is, he's talking to Jacob here. And I will watch over you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So Joshua would have known 
some of this, this language. In fact, can you go to Judges 6, verse 16? Judges 6, verse 16. As you walk by faith, you have to understand God will not leave you. He says this, but I will be with you, the Lord said to Gideon. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. So as you walk into uncharted territories, a lot of us, we could come up with all of these lists, right? Of why, why we wouldn't be given the promised land. <laughs> a lot of us could walk into the saying, there's no way. But God said back then to Abraham, he said it to Jacob, he said it to Gideon, he says it to Joshua, by the way, I will be with you and I will never forsake you. Crazy enough, if you go to Matthew 1, I love this image. If you start thinking about it in the New Testament version, in Matthew 20, 1, 23, it says this, see the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will name him Emmanuel, Jesus, right? And it's translated, God is with us. So now as we walk into the new covenant, as we walk into the New Testament, you can be assured that God will always be with us through who? Through, through Jesus Christ. And so there's this imagery of back then God was always with them. And guess what? Now because of Christ, he is always with us. And in fact, in Matthew 28, verse 20, I want to take a bigger picture here. Remember this, taking the feet, walking into the land. What does he say as, as we're told to, to, to experience the Great Commission? As we look to share the gospel, baptize, make disciples, he says at the very end, as you do these things, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So God is consistent in his language to Joshua and his disciples. I am always with you and I will never leave you. No, we might not be walking into the Israels or the Lebanons or the Syrias. We might not, but we might be walking into Middlebury. We might be walking into to Goshen. We might be walking into Dallas. And God says, oh, by the way, as you walk out sharing the gospel, I'm always with you. Jesus, Emmanuel, is with us today. And so, Joshua, as you and your Israelites get ready to cross over, by the way, I'm with you. And then he says in verse 6, he says this three to four times in this chapter. In Joshua 1, verse 6, be strong and courageous. I mean, this is the, this is the verse that everybody knows. For you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. In other words, all of these Israelites that are going to come in, remember this? We talked about this in the Pentateuch. God clearly has given the tribes certain pieces of land. But the only way you can give that piece of land away is you got to conquer it. You got to win it. And God says, I've already gone ahead. And just in case you need to hear this again, in verse 7 it says, Above all, be strong and courageous, very courageous, to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. I love this phrase, carefully observe. It also can mean to, to meditate. In other words, I want you to, to linger with God's word. I want you to read with thoughtfulness. And really what it says, I want you to begin to mutter God's word wherever you go. I want you to talk through. I want you to reiterate, my word is inside of you. As you walk into the enemy's camp, as you walk into new land, as you have the word inside of me, you'll walk with confidence. And I think the reason that many times the American church doesn't walk with confidence is because the word's not inside of us. So we don't hear the spirit of God speak to us. And then we start straying to the left. We start straying to the right. But when you have the word of God inside of us, in verse 8, then it says this, this book of instruction, it must not depart from your mouth. So as you go into new territories, recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. So you want to know the antidote for, for prosperity and, 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 and succeeding? Be in the word of God. Let him dictate your steps. Let him dictate and direct where you're going to go. Because as a result, I love this, that land is yours. But what we do is, is we try to figure it out ourselves, don't we? We try to come up with our own answers. Well, let me see how I can take that land. Let me see how I can walk into something that God's already ordained. He says in verse 9 of Joshua 1, Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do you think as, as Joshua walks into uncharted territories, you think God's trying to tell him something? I'm with you. I think sometimes we, we forget that in everyday life. Oh, you're having a hard time in your marriage? I'm, I'm with you. Oh, I, what kid, what school should my, my kid go to? I'm with you. I'll help make that decision. God is always with you and he never leaves you. And then in verse 10, and scripture says this, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people 
Go throughout the camp. And I, I love this. This is like, to me, one of the favorite verses of all of Joshua. He says, you tell everybody, get ready. Get provisions ready for yourselves for within three days, we're going to experience the promised land. You'll be crossing the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. So three days, guys, I need everybody to get ready. So he said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, remember what Moses the Lord's commanded you when he said, the Lord your God will give you rest and he will give you this land. Verse 14, your wives, your young children, the livestock, they, they can stay in the land Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But your fighting men, they must cross over into the battle formation ahead of you, of your brothers, and help them. In other words, I'm okay if you stay in the land that we didn't originally design. I'm okay if you stay there, but you better send your fighting men. We need you to help conquer the land. And then it says in verse 15, until, your brothers, uh, until the Lord gives our brothers rest as he has given you, and they too possess the land your Lord your God is giving them. You may then return to the land of your inheritance and take possession of what Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on the east side of the Jordan. And this is what I love. So Joshua is telling the officers, hey, guys, by the way, this is what I need you to do, right? I need you to get ready. I need you to go through all of the camp. I need you to tell everybody it's actually here. Everything that you've been complaining about. Everything that you've been whining about, everything that you've been praying for, by the way, in three days, we're going to see a move of God. Can you imagine if all of a sudden all of us knew that in three, day, in three days we're going to see a revival come to this nation? In three days we're going to see everything that we've longed for, it's going to come to fruition. And he says, get ready, officers, you go and tell everybody it's coming. And here's what I love. In verse 16, how do the officers respond? They said, Joshua, everything you've commanded us, we will do. And everywhere you send us, we will go. We will obey you as we obeyed Moses in everything. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. And anyone, it says in verse 18 to close it out, who rebels against your order and does not obey your words and all that you command him will be put to death. In other words, we're all in. If nobody, if, if somebody in this camp says, we're not doing this, guess what we're going to do? Kevin, what are we going to do? Kill him. We're going to kill him. And it ends in verse 18. This is a really cool picture. Above all, Joshua his people, his people say this to him, be strong and courageous. We're with you. We're in this until the end. And I think that's the beauty of what I see as one family with the Israelites. So I think that's the beauty that I see in the body of Christ. I'm telling you guys, when we do this as one, it feels like, yeah, we can do this. Oh yeah, you want us to take that land? We're in it. Joshua, I know this is ridiculous. You've never done anything like this, but we have your your back. And because the people collectively said as one, we're going to go into this land. Folks, we're going to walk into some incredible stories of God moving amidst his people. All right, this is the beginning of the historical books, the beginning of the book of Joshua. And when we get into tomorrow, I can't wait because you want to know why? It's time to break camp. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.